Craig. Okay. Great to be back at Montgomery, uh, one of the very best conferences in tech. Big thanks to Jamie uh, for 20 years. Congratulations. I th yeah. And thank you to Nilu, um, the Beyonce of cyber, I think. Uh, there's only one Nilu, so uh, one name only. But uh, we were business partners, co-investors, uh, have the opportunity to collaborate on government th things and have been friends for a long time. Uh, and such a pleasure to be up here today with uh, Walter Parks, truly one of Hollywood's greats. We are going to start with a clip uh, from Sneakers. And for the few of you uh, who maybe haven't seen it, this is Robert Redford as Martin Bishop leading a team of Sneakers, what today we would call a red team, right? I mean, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a scene with his antagonist, uh, Cosmo. So roll the tape. Would you step away from the ladder? Give me the box right now, or I will kill you right now. No. Just give me the box, Marty. I thought you couldn't kill your friend, Cos. I missed on purpose. Now give me the box. Take the goddamn thing. I don't want it. You win, I lose. That's what you want, isn't it? Say it. Say it. Yes! I'm sorry, cuz. You could have shared this with me. I know. You could have had the power. I don't want it. Don't you know the places we can go with this? Yeah, I do. There's nobody there. Exactly. The world isn't run by weapons anymore, or energy, or money. It's run by little ones and zeros, little bits of data. It's all just electrons. I don't care. I don't expect other people to understand this, but I do expect you to understand this. We started this journey together. It wasn't a journey, Oz. It was a prank. There's a war out there, old friend. A world war. And it's not about who's got the most bullets. It's about who controls the information. What we see and hear, how we work, what we think. It's all about the information. So hard to believe that was 30 years ago. Uh, Prussian. And nine years before that, Walter, you made uh, war games. So Matthew Broderick is a kid who hacks into NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command, and almost starts World War III. And 1983, the, arguably the most dangerous year of the Cold War, except for the year of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and Ronald Reagan watches the movie at Camp David the night after its national premiere. And clearly it gets in his head. And he shows up in the Oval Office that week, and he asks his chairman of the Joint Chiefs, is this real? Could this happen? And the chairman says, I'll get back to you, Mr. President, <laughs> and comes back to him a couple days later and says, it's even worse than you think. Yeah. So you were incredibly prescient. Uh, these narratives really hold up uh, 30 and almost 40 years later. And y you wrap narrative around the ones and zeros as, as uh, as is said in that scene. So talk to us about that. How do, how do you do it? First thing I see when I see that clip, I realize it was today he would have actually shot him in the arm as opposed yeah. to missing him. No, you know, it, as Nilo was saying, well, I didn't understand anything, my partner and I, about cyber, about digital technology. So we had to find tools to understand them themselves, ourselves which meant it wasn't a toolbox of expertise the way a, a, a professional would, but rather to find metaphors and language and sequences that would encapsulate the basis of the information and make it be understandable to a wider public. So in a funny way, the process we went through in understanding it and creating it 
is sort of the process that it then had on the policymakers who saw it. I had no recourse. In fact, we, I remember having a conversation with Larry, my writing partner at the time, about whether or not we should learn anything about programming. And I felt very much like we shouldn't because our audience doesn't know anything about programming. So the experts we spoke to, we were able to, and we needed to, push them to find language and metaphors that would be accurate, but understandable. And, um, you know, we talked on the phone the other day. There's probably no word that's more ubiquitous, you know, in the last 10, 15 years than narrative. I mean, it, it, it seems to be everywhere you look, and the counter narrative, whatever. And, you know, I could sort of argue that there's a, that this is a sort of a microcosm of why that's the case. We're living in this world that's sort of defined by all sorts of technologies and, and, and um, scientific issues, whether it's from a virus that stopped us in our tracks to artificial intelligence, that people don't understand. And one of the most you know, powerful methods of making someone understand something, and sadly, or misunderstand something, is narrative. We might not all be story makers, storytellers, but we're all story hearers. We all understand the power of a story when we, when we hear it and we can recognize its power. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's sort of the pivot here, which is how do we use those tools to get very complex ideas out in an engaging way to a larger audience? Which I, can't, I have to imagine is part, half your job. Uh, funny, yeah, I, th I think it is. I mean, especially on you know, technology diplomacy. Um, which is, is not something that has, has been a consolidated job in the U.S. government before, uh, but a lot of it is, is trying to persuade other people in the government and then counterparts in other countries uh, that, uh, to, to, to really viscerally understand these things and, and engage on them. Well, yeah, it's funny. I'm looking at that, and I was thinking back. That it really is, I think, the movie came out in 91 or 92, so it is over 30 years. There was hardly any laptops. And this was all at the fringe of thing, and now you know suddenly the U.S. State Department has a, an ambassador at large for digital and cyber. Yeah. And what I find so interesting thinking about that is that unlike other aspects of national security, which are in some ways siloed, mm -hmm. you know, you're an expert in counterterrorism, you're an expert in X, Y, Z, you're dealing with something which is a membrane that cuts across every aspect of national security, every aspect of our economy. Everything is tied together. I mean, as the man says, it is all about the information. I can't imagine how you balance that among the various stakeholders with, with, you know, with whom you work. So that, that is, it's one of the interesting realities of this is just as technology is transforming every aspect of our lives, right? I mean, we all saw this accelerate in the pandemic. It changed how my parents consume healthcare, it changed how my kids learn, changed how I earned a living. Uh, it's, it's cross-cutting in our foreign policy, too. And it, it ties into each of kind of the, the key priorities that are driving um, the country's diplomatic efforts right now. I'll, I'll highlight two of them. One is uh, really to ensure that Russia's invasion of Ukraine results in a strategic defeat for Russia. Uh, technology has been a huge part of uh, galvanizing the NATO alliance and, and uh, defending the Ukrainian enterprise uh, and inflicting costs on, on the Russians. Before you get to the segment, I have a question about that, which is the balancing of public sector and, and government, or uh, private sector. Yeah. So I remember hearing about the whole thing with Musk and whether or not the satellites were only gonna be using. I mean, unlike a lot of the other aspects of national security in which you've been involved, the, so much of innovation and so much of these services operate outside of the government. Right. Yes. So. As, as I, here as a CEO, I remember going into you know, many government meetings and my eyes would glaze over as my government counterparts would talk about public-private partnership because usually what that meant is give me your data, I'll classify it, and you get nothing back. Yeah. Um, I think the, uh, the war in Ukraine has uh, fundamentally accelerated how companies and governments work together in this area. I'll give you a, I'll give you a few examples. Please. You mentioned one of them, which is uh, Starlink and resilient satellite communications. It's going to be a huge part of our future. Uh, in conflict and otherwise. Um, I think we're a, we're a single digit number of years from integrated terrestrial, non-terrestrial uh, uh, communications in our, in our handsets. And uh, another one that was, was huge in Ukraine was migrating the Ukrainian government enterprise to the cloud before the invasion, which allowed for resilient provision of services uh, by the Ukrainian government to the Ukrainian people. You couldn't take it down 
uh, nearly as easily as you could have had they not done the migration uh, before February 24th of last year. And the third one is the, the kind of rapid intelligence sharing and patching uh, that happened across hundreds of millions of systems in Ukraine. To, I've seen, we've seen speculation right in the press that, that, hey, why didn't the big Russian cyber attacks happen? Well, I am, uh, they I was did gonna happen, ask. and they just weren't effective. Hmm. And that, that, was, that was your old world at Endgame, right? Of how to, how to yeah, my, find those attacks. My, my worlds have converged here. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fascinating. Um, I'm curious about something too, which is, uh, one of the reasons I'm here, we met because I became a director for uh, the Center for New American Security, and somehow as having been involved with these movies about early cyber, I was you know, brought in to consult or talk about these things. And strangely enough, I think for those first 20 years, most of the issues that were described in these movies about the essence of, of um, data protection, cybersecurity, were more or less the same. I mean, as you mentioned, a lot of our, our uh, statues were written as a result of some of the movies I've worked on. Right. Uh, and, and whether it's as simple as phishing or password protection or, or, or yeah. whatever, my sense is that that sort of started to change six, seven, eight, nine years ago because of AI, that suddenly it's a different ball game. Mm -hmm. Is, that, is mm -hmm. that a correct perception? Yeah, I think, that, I think that's right. I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's a, let me come back to AI in a minute. The, the, mm -hmm. I think the first thing you mentioned is, is kind of how cybersecurity issues have become more cross-cutting. I mean, it's a natural derivative of the digitization of everything. Absolutely. Right? So Absolutely. everything's connected. I have to worry about attacks you know, on my refrigerator, which is communicating back to its manufacturer, which raises a different question of just because we can connect something to the internet doesn't mean we necessarily should. Mm -hmm. um, but with the digitization of everything, think about all of our, all of our telecommunications infrastructure. Mm -hmm. you know, that's really kind of the, an, another priority in addition to Russia is uh, investing and, and aligning and competing with China all around the world on these issues and uh, telecommunications infrastructure. So wireless networks, satellite communications, cables, fiber, 5G, data yes. centers, all of it, 5G, right? Uh, Huawei, the big Chinese national champion, has, has essentially gotten a global scale uh, on a combination of IP theft and uh, subsidies from, from the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, they can come into a country in Africa or Southeast Asia with a low dollar bid uh, and a road project. It, it, it's interesting. I, I, I for a while served on the AI uh, group with CNAS, and I observed that, tell me if this is true, the sort of public-private sector separation of church and state that exists here is the case with China. So they can just go buy the company. The AI company. Yeah, in other words, I, so I, it's it's not only harvesting the technology, but it's like having a bead on this building energy. Whereas right. we have that separation. Right. I, I was at dinner. I was at a dinner in Dubai uh, with a group of Chinese executives who said this is before I was in my my current job. Mm -hmm. uh, and over dinner one evening, they sort of marveled and said, "How how do you Americans do it? How do you how do you fight you know competitively on the global stage with one arm tied behind your yeah. back? Why doesn't go your government help you?" Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think actually our government does help quite a bit, but uh, but not in the way the Chinese government does. Absolutely not. Where you know they're, they're well, they can have ownership in these companies. We our, co our country doesn't. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's as simple as that. Are you still? Is there still? I was noticing a couple years ago, sort of a resistance of, particularly whenever we want to get in AI, but particularly of like, you know, the big tech companies where really innovation in AI is happening. Yeah. It, providing those services for the government, just for political distancing, is that still an issue? So, so I think, look, um, you know, maybe, maybe this is a, a a good audience to to make a point on this. Um, yeah, I am of the view that, uh, uh, that our, our free society in a technologically competitive world only works if our private sector and our public sector are actually working together. Yeah. Um, we, uh, companies need the government uh, endorsing markets and removing friction and, uh, you know, we need the government on the front lines all around the world kind of pushing back on heavy-handed regulation in markets where you all want to grow your businesses. Um, and at the same time, uh, the, the, the government needs you access to all of that talent, uh, the technology, the innovation. As you said, most of the attack surface we care about is out there in the private sector. Yeah. Uh, and so there has to be a functional relationship here. And you know, I ran a business for a long time that had a footprint in DC and a footprint in Silicon Valley. 
And in the DC office, you know, everybody had a security clearance. And in the San Francisco office, I'd come into work on Monday morning and people would say, sorry, boss, you know, no security clearance for another seven years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a divide that we need, we need to build some bridges across. I wonder if there's, that's a way back to narrative, you know, that, that the sort of narrative of how, how these technologies are, are, are used is, is largely misunderstood by that uh, private sector. So I think all of us kind of came of age, Walter, re almost regardless of how old we are, this probably applies to people within a 20 year band or 25 year band. We came of age kind of in the, in the, you know, the, the Cold War ended, uh, serious people were talking about the end of history, the world is flat. There was this kind of implicit or explicit assumption that economic growth and and w would lead to political liberalization. Yeah. That hasn't happened. It hasn't happened, or at least it hasn't happened uniformly. Wow. A and so. Well, you're piece of the choir on that one. Was that? Well, no. Uh, and we might talk about yeah. this once. It goes back to this idea of the ubiquity of, 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 of narrative. Yeah, it seemed like the natural progression of things is toward liberal democracy, right? Well, and we're talking about. Sometimes I think we're almost in this post-enlightenment period. You know, for how many years did humankind sort of look to myth and narrative to understand huge processes that were sort of beyond their grasp, right? And, you know, three <laughs> nights of flood. It's perfectly, uh, yeah. a biblical explanation is perfectly good if you don't have a meteorological one, right? And suddenly in the, the enlightenment comes around and we have these tools of rationality um, and scientific observation where now we can use our rational thought to understand how the world works. It worked very well. Well, starting about, what, 10, 15 years ago, there's this explosion in technology, an explosion in complexity in the world, which sort of goes beyond our everyday un uh, uh, capability of understanding. So what do we go back to? We go back to narratives. Mm. Mm. Deep atavistic narratives, us against them, tribalism, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that sad irony that you would think that would be lead toward the very thing you're talking about, but instead we like leading towards sort of a tendency toward autocracy, which doesn't make sense in a way, but in another way, given how complex and difficult it is to process the reality out there, why wouldn't we ask for simpler answers? Mm. Why wouldn't I say it's, you know, you know, Islamic world against the Christian world. Yeah. It, I believe in my guy versus your guy. And, and it's, it's, it's a dangerous thing. So uh, you, you would, you would, we'd started going down the road of artificial intelligence. I think, I think uh, there, there's a, a, a vein there that we ought to mine for a minute. Um, I mean, chat GPT, obviously, you know, open AI kind of, this, this has exploded into the popular consciousness. I think a lot of people in this room have been working on it for a long time. You know, you were there years <laughs> before most of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's certainly a big piece of my portfolio. And what, what makes AI different, I think, um, and, and narratively more complicated is, uh, is its generative power, right? Where like, um, you know, an advance making a, a, a faster airplane doesn't necessarily uh, automatically lead to an even faster airplane, but the generative power of AI, you have this exponential accelerating pathway where early advantage uh, leads to compounding advantage, mm -hmm. um, which is really fundamentally different, I think, from uh, most, if not all, uh, most, certainly most other technology areas. I think there's maybe another part of it too. I had mentioned that book that uh, Kissinger co-wrote, which is that the decision-making that's governed by AI is harder to sort of deconstruct to find where the mistakes were. In other words, that, that kind of machine learning is happening at a level that, that is, is not as accessible to us. I mean, whether you were a commander or either running a company, you can actually deconstruct the decision chain and say, where did we make a mistake? Not so easy in AI. Yeah, uh, emphatically true. And you know, the, 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 the use cases that get unlocked here are obviously transformative. Um, I, I'm going to throw a question back at you, if mm. I may, mm. which is um, after years of making films, you're now a growth stage CEO, uh, yeah, raising money and hiring people <laughs> yeah. and, and going through all the you know, headache and heartache that so many people in this room. And have. here I happen uh, to be in this room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, t tell us about Dreamscape and, uh, and, and how, how it came about and where you're going with it. Well, it's... You know, the, the, my core business, the entertainment business, has gone through a period of incredible sort of confusion and 
at times free fall. Neela, we were talking about you know exhibitors. Who knows anymore? <laughs> movies have kind of turned into television. Television has turned into movies, um, and we're living in a very. I like to say sometimes no one lives in Hollywood. We just rent property in the Marvel universe, and it, and it's really sort of what the movies has, has come about. So I, I've always been interested in technologies, and I came across a particular. Um, virtual reality technology, which really spoke to me. I'm sure most people in this room have probably have had a headset. Have you had headsets on? Have I you have. spent? There's things about VR that I love and things I don't love. And the main thing was I didn't really like being alone. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I sort of think VR becomes something when it becomes a social engagement. Anyway, I had an opportunity to uh, sample an extraordinary technology out of Geneva, Switzerland that was created by some medical technologists that actually tracks your body and turns you into an avatar and allows you to exist inside of a virtual environment with other people. And uh, I, I remember traveling there in 2017 and being with a friend in this insane digital world who he picked up a burning torch and threw it at me and I was able to catch it. All of this being generated in a headset in real time. And you're like throwing a dowel back and it, forth. Yeah. But you feel it. You feel it. Though, Absolutely. Right? No, it's yeah. a real thing. Yeah. We have something yeah. called a multi-tool. Yeah, right. If you really looked at it, it's a piece of PC pipe uh, and, and with uh, sensors on it. But then the computer can turn into anything you want. Right. Anyway, we created a first company, Dreamscape of Mercer, that was about um, its, its application in, in entertainment. And did quite well. Was challenged by the, uh, by the uh, pandemic. But where the re really interests me and where the real need for this is in education right now. I mean, you, you, you suddenly, funny, you were talking about, um, we were both talking about the ubiquity of digital uh, transformation in our world. And, and I realized that whether it's how I watch a movie or how I get around a city or how I buy music or how I trade stocks or basically how I do any aspect of human exchange has been inextricably, inalterably changed by digital technology forever, yeah. except for education. Huh. Huh. I mean, just think about it. For the most part, education is kind of like it was for the last 2,000 years. Yeah. And even when it became digital during the pandemic, it was largely the, the term they use are sage on stage. You'd video someone and whatever. Well, suddenly we have these incredible immersive technologies that will only be further advanced by things like 5G and mobile, uh, you know, cloud computing that will be able to do these computations and deliver directly to a headset. Suddenly you have this, this sort of intersection of tremendous need, mm -hmm. tremendous need. Uh, I saw something that um, UNESCO put out, it estimated, I think there's about 180 million college students right now on the globe and that the global demand for university education going into 2030 would be something like 400 million. And you'd have to like build, you know, five 80,000 <laughs> person <laughs> universities every week for 10 years to do that. So if you're gonna educate the world, a whole bunch of it's gonna be digital. Yep. And of that that's digital, some of that's gonna be in a headset. So this just suddenly said, okay, this is a classic sort of dislocation where there's a tremendous need and there's a giant market and suddenly there are digital tools that could deliver things. So fortunately, we, we partnered up with an extraordinary institution called ASU, Arizona State University. I, I don't know if you've all had a chance to look into what they're doing over there in Tempe, but it's really a, just an, an incredible hotbed of innovation in many, many different fields. And we're trying to sort of reinvent how we can use these digital technologies on behalf of both uh, uh, university and K through 12 education. And how I ended up here, I have no idea, but I'm very grateful I have. These things only make sense in hindsight, I think. Well, exactly. We're on some kind of road. I don't know who put us on it. <laughs> here, here. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions uh, in the room. I believe that was uh, part of the plan, if there are any, about movie making or technology diplomacy, the intersection of the two. There's one. Yes. Uh, the question is about preparation for my current job. Uh, well, it's funny. I, um, I worked at a bike and ski shop in high school and college, fixing bikes and tuning skis. Uh, I got a lot more training for that job than I got for this one. Uh, <laughs> that is one key difference. Um, I say that a little bit tongue in cheek. I think it's also one of those roles where 
you know, for me, it just felt like every element of my experience kind of kind of came together. Um, but the uh, I, I was saying this earlier. The I was the State Department is a curious person's paradise because anything in the world, if you're interested in, uh, you know, you want to learn everything you can about telecommunications in Laos, or you want to learn about upstream critical minerals for semiconductors, or you, you want to learn about the latest in quantum sensing. There's somebody there who can take you all the way to the bottom of the, bottom of the pool on it. Uh, and so that's been, a, that's been a great pleasure. What was the closest thing to your department that we had before your department? There was, some, there was pre-existing work that was happening. The, the, the remit of, of, uh, of my office uh, really spans four elements. Uh, cybersecurity policy, and that work was happening previously at the department in, in, dif in different places. Uh, what we call digital policy, which is really largely telecommunications infrastructure, satellites, cables, fiber, wireless networks, 5G, 6G, data centers, the virtualization of everything. <laughs> um, and then uh, the third is, is brand new, which is critical and emerging technologies. Our initial focus areas are quantum, AI, and synthetic biology. Uh, and then the fourth piece is sort of cross-cutting. It's, it's the values and digital freedom piece, you know, really making sure that all the other pieces are built on a foundation of kind of respect for a, a digital ecosystem that is free, open, interoperable, secure. Uh, so, so that's the remit. And I'm, 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 I don't want to take other time, but. Um, is your attention equal between enabling proper users and resisting bad actors? Uh, yeah, it's both. It's, it's, um, but it's the diplomacy of that, right? It's, it's not defending systems in the United States. That's mm -hmm. Homeland Security. It's not conducting offensive mm -hmm. cyber operations. That's mm -hmm. DOD. Uh, but it's the diplomatic work related to all of it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example from last week. Last week, um, I was at Mobile World Congress, where maybe some of you were in Barcelona, um, talking with uh, European interlocutors about regulatory issues. Um, you know, take uh, network usage fees as yeah. one that maybe is, is near and dear to your world, Walter, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where uh, this is the basic idea that, uh, a, 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 an idea that is prevalent in parts of Europe that the, the telcos, uh, that the platform providers, content creators should pay the telcos for bandwidth. I think you could make an equally compelling argument that the telco should be pay, playing, paying the content uh, developers for creating all the stuff that's driven, <laughs> you know, a 30% annual increase yeah. in, right? So uh, we really are and, pushing and back. You're, on you're saying no one should be taxing any of it either way. <laughs> we, we, uh, yeah, uh, yes, uh, I think that, uh, you know, net neutrality is kind of a, a, a sacred basic tenet here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's that piece. And then, you know, later in the week, I was in Brussels at NATO. Uh, talking about you know defending the NATO enterprise and uh, and and supporting Ukraine, so it, it's both sides. Yeah, I understand. Well, listen, it's yes. Do you want to comment on the uh, Chinese balloon and any involvement you may have had in tracking that? So, so uh, no, I don't want to comment on it, uh, <laughs> but I will tell you a funny story about it. Uh, I found myself in the Philippines um, short, very days after all that was happening, and uh, was at dinner uh, one evening, and I got seated uh, next to a Chinese counterpart. And uh, over the course of the meal, we did have a spirited discussion about the differences between a civilian meteorological airship and a spy balloon. <laughs> so, uh, but I think the broader point here is uh, we're going to see a lot more of this. You know, we're, we're in this era of of uh, hopefully it's not conflict, it's competition. Um, and leading with the affirmative, positive, compelling narrative vision of what that shared technology future uh, can, can do for all of us around the world is, uh, is the bedrock we, we should come back to. Let's hope. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks.